Good evening and welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. I'm Henry Fortunato, Director of Public Affairs. Um, why are you here? Why has this happened? I want to tell a very brief story. There's a woman named Alice Kitchen. How many of you know Alice Kitchen? So this is the plenary session of the Alice Kitchen Fan Club, of which I am a charter member. Um, some people think that Alice is um, persistent. Some think that she's pushy. Some even call her a pain. But I think she's just terrific. If you want to know why, why this is here, for more than 12 months, Alice has been lobbying the library to make this program happen. And, and I told her... I told her what it would take to, to bring this about, and Alice went out and, and she pulled together the coalition and, and the group of, of organizations that made this possible. I think this is just what we're all about, you know? A, a public space performing a public service designed by a member of the public creating a program of public interest. So Alice, Alice, wherever you are, please, please, um, there you are. Stand up, Alice. No one else can do that to me the rest of this year. No, I'm actually, I'm actually kidding. Um, if you've got an idea, you have a program you think will work, um, please give us a call. Henry or Crosby are always willing to talk to anyone about what makes a good program uh, at the Kansas City Public Library. Okay, so um, I am not going to actually introduce uh, tonight's guest. Um, that honor uh, belongs to Andrea Ruth. Um, she's an attorney with 20 years of experience in health policy in Missouri, and she's currently the executive director of the Missouri Health Advocacy Alliance. That is a coalition of 40 organizations that provide a united consumer voice for quality, affordable health care in Missouri. Um, she's a lifelong resident of the Show Me State, and she graduated from Southwest High School right here in Kansas City. Plus, she got her JD from UMKC. Um, please welcome Andrea, who will uh, make the formal announcement and the formal introduction of tonight's guest. Thank you, Henry, and thank you to the library staff. You know, uh, Alice Kitchen is very persistent, and she's had Steve Wolfolk and Todd Boyer and Henry and I uh, working diligently to make sure that this evening was possible. So I welcome you here tonight on behalf of the board and members of the Missouri Health Advocacy Alliance. Uh, I want to welcome you here for a very special look inside the uh, health insurance industry. Um, we wanted to take a second to uh, acknowledge and thank the rest of the co-sponsors of the event. Uh, and just so you'll know, they have tables set up sort of behind me and over in the cafe area. So if you're interested in talking to some of these people, you might stop by when we finish tonight. Uh, that is Missouri Healthcare for All, Jobs with Justice, uh, Communities Creating Opportunities, also known as CCO, the Kansas Health Consumer Coalition, the Gray Panthers, Mid-America Regional Council and their Regional Healthcare Initiative, the Loretto of Kansas City, the Center for Practical Bioethics, and the Disability Coalition for Healthcare Reform. If you would um, acknowledge them, and also I, we had an anonymous sponsor who uh, donated some money to make this event happen, and I'd just like to acknowledge all of those people and all of those groups for hosting Wendell Potter here tonight. Would you acknowledge them with me? So the Missouri Health Advocacy Alliance is honored to bring Wendell Potter here tonight to help us all understand why we as healthcare consumers must educate ourselves about healthcare, about healthcare insurers, and the new healthcare law in an environment where some in the industry have a strong interest in misleading us. And Wendell's going to talk a little bit about that from the inside perspective tonight. 
Wendell Potter, um, following a 20-year career as the corporate public relations executive, left his position as head of communications for Cigna, which many of you know is one of the nation's, nation's largest health insurers. And he left to help socially responsible organizations, including those like ours, who advocate for meaningful health care reform, to achieve our goals. In widely covered testimony, which some of you may have seen before the Senate Commerce, Science, and Technology Committee in June of 2009, Wendell provided testimony regarding the inner workings of insurance companies, including the insurance industry's successful efforts to develop and implement strategic communications plans based on public relations, advertising, and lobbying efforts to defeat reform initiatives. And by the way, we the public are still getting some of those messages and we're still often believing that some of the misleading messages are true. Well, since then, Wendell has testified before two House committees, and he's briefed several members of Congress and their staffs. He's appeared with members of Congress at several press conferences. He's spoken at more than 100 public forums, and he's been the subject of numerous articles in the US and foreign media. Uh, Wendell has been featured on many news and editorial programs, including those on PBS like Bill Moyers. He's been on MSNBC with Keith Olbermann, Rachel Maddow, and the like. Uh, he's been on CNN on several different shows, including Anderson Cooper 360, uh, the Wolf Blitzer Situation Room show, and the Bill Maher show. He's been on C-SPAN. He's been on ABC, he's been on CBS, NBC, Fox, and the BBC. He's been on numerous radio uh, shows, and he's been uh, quoted in daily periodicals that many of you read, I know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Politico, the Huffington Post, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, I could go on and on. He's been quoted in dailies, he's been quoted and covered in the wire services, and many monthly journals. Wendell currently serves as a senior fellow on healthcare for the Center for Media and Democracy, which is an independent, nonpartisan public interest organization, and he speaks out on both the need for a fundamental overhaul of the American healthcare system and on the dangers to American democracy and society of the decline of the media as a watchdog. And we, he believes that this has contributed to the growing and increasingly unchecked influence of corporate public relations. At Cigna, Wendell served in a variety of positions over 15 years of his career there. Most recently, he was head of corporate communications, and he was a chief a corporate spokesperson for the company. Prior to that, he had a communications at Humana. He also has um, been a reporter covering uh, politics in Tennessee and business there. He also covered the state legislature there. He was um, later promoted to the Scripps Howard News Bureau in Washington where he covered Congress and the White House and the Supreme Court. Wendell served as a press sec secretary to a Tennessee gubernatorial candidate, and he was a lobbyist at both the state and federal levels. He has his uh, Bachelor of Arts in Communication from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and he's done postgraduate work in journalism and public relations. Wendell's book, uh, which you still, there are still a few copies over there to purchase, but it's a book called Deadly Spin, gives us an inside look at the health insurance industry. And it tells us how the profit motive of the industry has insurance companies spend billions of dollars on PR campaigns. And they're meant to mislead us. They're meant to mislead Americans, divert our attention, and frighten us. It's my honor now to introduce a truly courageous man who allowed himself to see the truth about his part in these PR campaigns. 
He allowed himself to get present to the impact of that PR campaign, those PR campaigns, and what it, the impact it's had on people and their health care. And he decided to do something about it. So with that, I give you Wendell Potter. Andrea, thank you so much. And Henry, thank you. Thank you, Alice, wherever you are. Thank you all. I really am so grateful for the chance to come back to Kansas City. I love this place. I've been here many times. Um, I most recently was serving as a consumer representative to the NAIC based here and uh, have friends there and throughout the community. So thank you again for inviting me to come back. You know, most introductions cover what a person does or has done in his or her life. I'd like to take a, a few minutes to go a little bit beyond what I do and tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, but doing so, I believe that you'll have a better understanding of how I came to understand how our healthcare system operates and why I felt compelled to change the direction of my life about three years ago. First, I'm a, I'm a husband and a father. My wife, Lou, and I have been married for 30 wonderful years. Uh, we've been married for longer than that, but I'll, I'll say 30 wonderful, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and we've had, uh, we've had, we have two wonderful children, Alex and Emily, who will be uh, even more wonderful when they make Lou and me grandparents. Uh, we're still waiting. I'm also the son of Blaine and Pearl Potter, two of the finest and most ethical and hardest working people that I've ever known. Mom and Dad grew up in a tiny town called Mountain City, which is in the far northeastern tip of Tennessee where it meets Virginia and North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth, and I've traveled a lot, and I still claim it as one of the most beautiful places. I spent the first six years of my life uh, there on Mom and Dad's small farm outside of Mountain City, and they also owned and operated a little uh, country store called Potter's Grocery, uh, which was right next to the house, uh, but unfortunately it was a money loser. Uh, they didn't make a lot of money by any means. So after my first year in school, we moved to Kingsport, Tennessee, where Dad got a job in a factory that everybody just called the glass plant. Dad didn't make a lot of money, uh, but he and Mom put aside a little bit every payday to send me to college. They were determined that I would get um, a better education and that I would be um, the first person in either of their families to get a college education. I'll never be able to repay them for the countless sacrifices that they made so that I will, would have a better education than they had and that uh, uh, hopefully that I would have a, a, an easier life than they had. Being religious people, mom and dad took me to church every Sunday morning and every Sunday night and every Wednesday night. <laughs> so it might not come as a surprise to you that when I, uh, as soon as I got to college, I decided that I'd had quite enough church for a while. Uh, and before long, I uh, felt I'd had enough of the hills of East Tennessee, too. Uh, right after I got my college degree, I headed for the Flatlands uh, and a job as a reporter at one of the big newspapers in Memphis. And I was lucky to get that job uh, straight out of, out, of, out of school. In fact, I've been lucky throughout my, career, my careers in both journalism and public relations. When I was 23, I was uh, sent, as Andrea said, to... Uh, cover the Tennessee legislature in Nashville. And when I was 25, I was sent to Washington to cover Congress and, and the White House uh, for Scripps Howard and the Supreme Court. I'd love to go back and cover the Supreme Court hearing coming up in March about the health care reform law. Um, Scripps Howard owns a lot of TV stations and newspapers across the country. After a few years, though, I was enticed back to Tennessee, again, as Andrea mentioned, to get into uh, to be a press secretary for a guy who was running for governor. And uh, that led me to a career in, in PR. And I eventually wound up at two of the biggest health insurance companies in the country, at Humana and Cigna. I rose rapidly up the ranks. Again, I've been very fortunate. By, night, by 2001, I had become head of corporate communications at Cigna in Philadelphia, which in many respects is about as far away as you can get from Mountain City and Kingsport, Tennessee. When I left my job in 2008, I was one of the health insurance industry's top PR guys. And I was paid pretty good for what I did. 
uh, which in many cases was to persuade people to believe things that um, was not necessarily in their best interest many times. A colleague of mine once gave me a framed quote as a sort of gag gift uh, for a birthday. Uh, the quote was, be obscure clearly. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's true. It was a quote uh, by E.B. White um, of many years ago. I got to be pretty darn good at doing just that. One of the responsibilities I had when I was still an insurance company executive was handling financial communications. It was my job to explain to reporters whether my company had met Wall Street's profit expectations when we announced quarterly earnings. If we hadn't, I had to explain why we hadn't. Uh, so I had to know my company and the insurance industry inside out. I had to know how insurance companies operate and how they make money. Considering that I'm no longer uh, obscuring the truth about insurance companies, I'm sure that those companies that employed me and gave me those promotions regret every promotion they gave me over the years. <laughs> That's because the, the, the higher up the corporate ladder I climbed, the more I could see what insurance companies do to keep their shareholders happy. I eventually became utterly disgusted with myself serving as a spokesman for an industry that I came to realize is quite willing to sacrifice the lives of, of thousands of people every year to make a few bucks. One of the things my mother told me back in Tennessee many, many times uh, was don't ever get above your raisin. And uh, another was don't ever forget where you came from. I'm sorry to say that I almost forgot. I almost did forget. And I might still be obscuring clearly for the insurance industry had it not been for a fateful trip that I made back home to the mountains uh, where I grew up. That was in the summer of 2007. I had been writing a policy paper, as it turned out, that year that the insurance industry was, would be using to try to convince people that the problem of Americans without health insurance wasn't so much of a problem after all even though there were about 46 million people at the time who didn't have health insurance. And uh, now there are more than 50 million people who are in that situation. I wrote that many of the uninsured had simply chosen to shirk their responsibility to themselves and to their families. I'm sure you're probably familiar with this point of view. If you're uninsured, there's no one to blame but yourself. In July of 2007, while I was writing that paper, I flew down to Tennessee to visit my folks for a few days. While I was there, I came across a, a newspaper story about something called a health care expedition that was being held a few miles across the Tennessee-Virginia state line. Uh, and it was uh, an expedition that was being held at the Wise County, Virginia fairgrounds. The story said that thousands of people were expected to travel from as far away as Ohio and, and uh, South Carolina and Georgia uh, to, to, to a three-day event uh, that was being uh, held where doctors and nurses would be volunteering their time. So I had decided to go take a look. After all, it was my job to be curious, and I was writing a paper about these folks. I drove up to Wise County early the next morning, and I'll tell you, that stretch of highway between Kingsport, Tennessee, and Wise County, Virginia, turned out to be my road to Damascus. Uh, nothing I don't think could have prepared me for what I saw when I got there that day. I know I wouldn't be with you here tonight had I not made that journey. As it turned out, it was also a, a very spiritual journey for me, and uh, it still is. I'm on a spiritual journey. It changed my life. When I got there, the parking lot was jam-packed. Many people were still in their cars and their trucks. Uh, that's because they had slept in them all overnight, some for more than one night. When the fairground gates had opened at 6 o'clock, the place had begun to look like a refugee camp in a war zone. Enormous lines of people, many of whom were soaking wet because it had been raining that morning, uh, stretched out of view. As I walked around, I noticed that some of those lines led to barns and animal stalls that um, had been scrubbed down by the volunteers before I got there, before the people showed up and where doctors and nurses were treating patients. Except for curtains that served as makeshift doors on the animal stalls, there was almost no privacy. Remember, people, this was 
21st century America. Well, it certainly didn't look like it or feel like it. That day I realized that the people in those lines were really no different from me. They could have been my relatives or my former neighbors. They just hadn't had the good fortune to get that good education that my, my parents had sacrificed so that I could get and to land a high-paying job like I had. And then it hit me almost literally. It was almost like a bolt of lightning. And this is where the spirituality kind of comes into it. Those people were indeed my neighbors. Until that day, I hadn't even thought of them as being human beings. To me, they had just been numbers on a Census Bureau spreadsheet. Nothing more. But when I came face to face with them, they were no longer just numbers and they never could be again. I'll never forget that experience and especially how I felt the very instant I walked through the fairground gates. Being from uh, Missouri, from Kansas, from this area, I, I suspect many of, them, of you have, have come into contact every now and with an electrical fence. You ever touched one? Uh, well, it felt like that to me, like an electrical current was running through me. Uh, and uh, uncontrollably, I, I started tearing up uh, when I realized what was going on and realizing that I was at least partly responsible for that scene. I knew then and there that I could not in good conscience continue serving as a spokesman for the health insurance industry. I was forced to come to grips with the fact that the profit obsession of the industry that I worked for was one of the main reasons that those people had to go to such lengths to get basic medical care. A few days earlier, I had literally been writing those people off I had allowed myself to believe that they were irresponsible. I could not have been more wrong. Those people were not irresponsible. Our health care system, or what passes for a system in this country, had left them behind. I discovered later that two-thirds of the nearly 4,000 people who were there that weekend had jobs. Most of them worked for small businesses that uh, could no longer afford to provide coverage to their employees. Many of them had tried to buy policies on their own. But like millions of other Americans who try to do that, they'd been turned down because of what insurance companies call pre-existing conditions. A lot of them had diabetes and other serious illnesses. Insurance companies refused to sell them coverage because, and they still do, because they didn't want to have to pay for their care. Others had had their policies canceled when they needed them most, when they got sick. So a few months later, I, I quit my job. And I know now that I, I think I know now that I found my real calling, which is to explain to people just how broken our so-called system really is and how urgent it is for us to transform it. The very first audience, as Andrea mentioned, that I spoke to after quitting uh, my job was Congress. As reform legislation was taking shape, legislation that promised to transform our health care system to better serve us all, I noticed, I noticed the beginning of the insurance industry's campaign to mislead the public and to begin to tear reform apart. I noticed it, I recognized it because I had been a part of it. And I felt to step up as a former insider to try to stop it or at least to draw attention to what was going on. One of the things that, uh, that pushed me off the sidelines was a quote that I came across during that time that I read was a favorite of President Kennedy's. The poet and, and philosopher Dante wrote nearly 700 years ago that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who, in times of moral crisis, maintain their neutrality. So my decision to testify before the Senate Commerce Committee on June the 24th, 2009, was to a large extent motivated by my fear of spending eternity in one of the hottest places in hell. <laughs> and folks, fear is one of the best motivators, as I'm sure most of you can relate to, and as I'll explain in more detail in a few minutes. What I did on that day in June 2009 was to explain the links that insurance companies go to, including dumping their sick policyholders just to meet Wall Street's profit expectations. If you seek medical care, you're not a patient to these companies or to their executives. You're an expense. As I explained to Congress, insurers have come up with ways to help keep the sick and needy off of their books and off of their balance sheets. 
like raising premiums to unaffordable levels on small businesses when a child of a worker gets sick, and like canceling the policies of thousands of women every year when they've been diagnosed with breast cancer. How many of you or people close to you have been treated this way, like an expense rather than a, than a person or a patient? I'm sure many of you have. Another way insurance companies are keeping their directors in Wall Street happy is by shifting more and more the cost of care from them to us. At least 30 million Americans are now underinsured because they've been shifted into plans with such limited benefits or high deductibles that they have to pay more out of their own pockets than their family budgets will allow. How many of you or people close to you fall into that category? And more and more of you will be raising your hand. If I were doing this presentation next year, I know I'd see a lot more hands. So as many of you know, in a high deductible plan, you have to pay a lot of money, often thousands of dollars before your insurance company will pick up a dime of your medical cost. And when your insurer does eventually pay, you still have co-payments and the fear that a treatment or procedure that your doctor says you need won't be covered. I've met people who are now in plans with $50,000 annual deductibles. Those folks pray every night that they won't get sick. Folks, if you don't remember anything else from our time together tonight, please remember this, that almost all of us in this country are just a layoff away from losing our coverage. And more and more of us are being priced out of the health insurance market. Or we're having to buy inadequate coverage because of the constant pressure that insurance companies are under from Wall Street to increase their profits. I knew that as soon as I explained all this to members of Congress that my life was probably going to change and change forever, and it, and it certainly has. I, I knew that the chances of my working in the insurance industry again, again would probably be slim to none. Not that I wanted to, uh, but I, I never expected to have a new full-time career as, uh, I call myself a truth teller. Um, and I'm still at it. And that's because uh, although Congress did pass health care reform, the special interests are still hard at work trying to mislead people about it. So I'm dedicated to exposing the lies and calling attention to those who are, who are dedicated to misleading you for no other reason than to advance their own selfish agendas. I worry, frankly, that the bad guys will win, which makes what I'm trying to do all the more urgent. When the debate on reform began, polls showed that most Americans were strongly in favor of it because most of us knew just how awful the health care system had become. Well, that scared the daylights out of health care executives. So they and their friends launched a huge and well-financed campaign to persuade us that uh, sweeping change to the system would actually be bad for us. The truth is the only thing that they were worried about was how bad reform might be to their profits. Unfortunately, their campaign has worked in many ways. They, or more accurately, their surrogates, their shills, uh, have been winning in the court of public opinion. Most people don't know how the law will help them, and, um, and I think we're in real danger of losing what we've won or letting, and letting insurance companies regain full control of our of, again, what passes for a health care system in this country. The political rhetoric has, has been so intense, it has obscured uh, the many reasons why reform was needed in the first place. And many Americans are in an, a state of utter confusion about the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, if that's what you prefer to call it, and even whether it's still the law of the land. And that's exactly the environment that the insurance industry has paid millions of dollars to create. So what I'm trying to do is to remind Americans why reform was necessary, why we needed change. And I'm telling folks what the new law actually does for us and who it's already benefiting. And just as important, I'm sounding an alarm. We must stay on guard against the PR lies that are being told to get us to become unwitting soldiers for them in their ongoing battle to tear reform apart along with the Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security programs, which mean so much to our families. Before I, go on, let's, before I go on, let's go back just for a minute to Wise County. The guy who organizes those health care expeditions, as he calls them, is an Englishman 
by the name of Stan Brock, who founded Remote Area Medical in 1985 to fly doctors to remote villages in third world countries, starting uh, with villages near the Amazon, where he spent a lot of time. It never occurred to Stan back then that most of his healthcare expeditions would eventually be in the United States. And not just in remote places like Wise County, Virginia, but in Los Angeles, where I just was yesterday, and Chicago and other big cities. Every year, Remote Area Medical helps tens of thousands of uninsured and underinsured Americans get care that they otherwise couldn't afford. But that's just a drop in the ocean, and the water level is rising. Now, I'm sure many of you are thinking, well, that couldn't happen to me. Uh, I'm never going to have to resort to getting care in an animal stall. I've got a good job, and I've got good health insurance. I'm sorry for the folks who don't, but, uh, you know, most Americans have coverage. So why do we need to uh, really muck things up with reform anyway? Okay, how many of you have private insurance that covers everything you need with a reasonable copayment? It's good. It's good. I don't know what I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you're, you're not the only one. How many of you depend on insurance through your job? You get your job through the workplace. Yes. Most of us. And how many of you are struggling with rising premiums or high deductibles? And how many of you depend on Medicare or Medicaid or Social Security? Now, of those of you who have private insurance, raise your hand if you have a guarantee I guarantee that this time next year, or even this time next month, that you'll still have it, that nothing will happen between now and then that will force you and maybe even your entire family into the ranks of the uninsured. Well, you're lucky. Uh, how many of you are confident beyond a shadow of a doubt that your children and grandchildren will have the coverage that they need, that they'll always have access to care that their doctors say they need? Well, if you raised your hand, you have a very big trust fund, and I mean a very, very big one, or you're a citizen of another country. <laughs> I've traveled almost constantly over the past uh, two and a half years, and I haven't met anyone yet, including some mighty rich folks who have the same peace of mind that people in Canada and England and Germany and France and many other countries have that when it comes, when it comes to health care. When I was in the insurance industry, my colleagues and I worked very hard to discredit the health care systems uh, in those countries and others, to, and, and we made most Americans scoff at them, to, to, to fear them. We wanted to obscure the reality that people in other parts of the world have guaranteed high-level health care that will not bankrupt their families, not even close. And there's no reason, folks, why we shouldn't in this country have the same peace of mind. The reality, and this is not obscuring reality, the, real, the reality is that regardless of our age and the color of our skin, how much money we have in the bank, or who we voted for in the, next, the last election, or who we're going to vote for in the next one, just about every one of us, sooner or later, will more than likely become a victim in one way or another of a health care system that has gotten completely out of whack. It's so out of whack that it has become not only the most expensive health care system on the planet, but also one of the most inefficient and inequitable, which is why healthcare transformation, not just healthcare reform, but transformation, is critical for the future of our country. Continuing with our current healthcare system will bankrupt America and many families, many more families as well. A doctor friend of mine won't even call what we have in this country a system. He refers to it as a sickness industry. Uh, and that's because a lot more money can be made treating people after they get sick than in keeping them from getting sick in the first place. We don't do nearly enough uh, to keep people from uh, needing most of, the, most of the services of hospitals and doctors uh, in this country. And when you look closely at this sickness industry of ours, you'll find that it's the fastest growing industry in America, generating more than $2.6 trillion for several companies and individuals who are doing quite well financially. 
Many of those companies are profit-driven giants like the ones that I work for whose stock is traded on Wall Street and whose executives have a, a single-minded focus on enriching themselves and their shareholders. Folks, trust me on this. Because of that Wall Street, that Wall Street takeover of healthcare in this country, there are few incentives for the healthcare industry and the components of the healthcare industry to uh, transform itself. Uh, that's why change in this country must come from outside, from, from employers, from governments, from families and individuals who are the ultimate payers for health care and health care services. And that's why I've dedicated my life to finding other like-minded individuals, including business owners and, and health care professionals, anyone, frankly, who will listen to me, uh, and who's ready to stay up and st stand up and say, enough is enough. And, and that's why I'm here today. Health Affairs Magazine, uh, which is a, a very well-respected uh, peer-reviewed journal, uh, carried an article last September describing how a decade of health care cost increases has completely, completely wiped out real income gains for the average American family. Both health care and health insurance are becoming vastly more expensive while household incomes are dropping. Our sickness industry is failing more and more Americans every year, and we're paying a very big economic price for that fact as individuals, as families, and as a country. For most of my career, though, I didn't want you to believe that. It was my job to make you believe that we have the best health care system in the world and that, and that health insurance companies could uh, help fix whatever problems might exist, like controlling costs and getting more people insured. I was part of a big and still ongoing effort to mislead you so thoroughly that you wouldn't even consider supporting any health care reform proposal that might hurt health insurance company profits. For most of the time that I worked in the health care industry, I was a true believer in the notion that the free market system could work just as effectively in health care as any other sector of the economy. Although toward the end of my career, I was seeing firsthand what insurance companies and, and others will do to make sure that their directors and shareholders stay happy. I'll pause here by saying I'm, I'm not a socialist. <laughs> I am a capitalist. I own stock in companies as well. I've been blessed financially. Um, but I have seen firsthand that the free market system, the unfettered free market system that many advocate, simply does not work to our benefit in the healthcare system, healthcare in the healthcare industry, and then I made that fateful trip back to um, to Wise County. And folks, soon after that, I had to explain to the world, uh, because of the job that I had, why the company I worked for had denied coverage for a liver transplant that uh, might have saved the life of of a beautiful 17-year-old girl named Nataline Sarkeesian. Nataline's doctors at UCLA Medical Center uh, believe that she had a better than even chance, actually more than a 60% chance, they felt, of li living at least five years and possibly many more if she could get a new liver. Her parents were optimistic. Uh, in fact, a perfect match had been found, and her doctors were preparing Nataline for surgery. But her doctors and parents were shocked when Cigna notified them just hours before the surgery was about to take place that it was not going to pay for the transplant after all. A Cigna medical director 2,500 miles away said he didn't think that the transplant would be appropriate for Nataline. And it's despite the fact that her doctors, her treating surgeons, uh, felt confident that she could benefit from it and, and maybe live for many years. Well, Natalie's parents were determined to fight for their daughter's life, so they, they began to get word out to the, to the media, first in Los Angeles, and it went viral. Uh, it became such a highly publicized case that uh, my phone was ringing off the hook. I was getting calls from media all over the place, in this country and from around the world. And it got so intense that a few days later, Cigna did agree to cover it. But the company's change of heart came too late. Five days before Christmas in 2007, Nataline died. 
and so did any desire that I had to continue working for the insurance industry. Soon after Natalie's parents laid her to rest, I walked away from a high-paying job that, uh, uh, and a few months later, I began to speak out about health, how health insurance companies really operate. Folks, access to appropriate and often life-saving health care is becoming available increasingly to fewer and fewer of us every day. Even those of us who, like the Sarkeesians, have what we assume is decent, comprehensive insurance coverage. But again, you don't have to take my word for it. The effects of this disastrous state of affairs are, are really plain to see. Let's look at just a few useful measures of a population's overall health. First, in the category of life expectancy. According to the CIA, that's a central intelligence agency which does a lot of fact gathering, the U.S. ranks 50th in the, 50th in the world in terms of life expectancy. Now let's, let's look at infant mortality. We rank 33rd, just ahead of companies like Romania and Mexico. Now, the U.S. has some of the best health care professionals and the best health hospitals and medical schools in the country, I, in the world, and, and, and uh, I don't know any, anyone who would dispute that. So, so then why do we score so poorly in these basic measures of national health and well-being? It's because our so-called system is not working for many of us anymore. Here's another revealing measure. Uh, the U.S. ranks 54th in the world in terms of fairness, which is a measure to, of the extent to which the best health care is available equally to a, a, a country's citizens. That's behind countries like Bangladesh and Tanzania. And then there's this shameful statistic. 45,000 Americans die every year because they don't have access to the care that they need. That doesn't happen in any other developed country. And it certainly wouldn't happen here if we really did have the best health care system in the world. America spends thousands of dollars more per capita on health care than any other country, yet our health outcomes, such as life expectancy, are not even in the top ten. And this clearly indicates that much of America's health care spending is not contributing uh, to, uh, to improved health. That's a big picture. Now let's take a, a look quickly at what this worsening state of our sickness industry is doing to families and to individuals. One reason the number of uninsured Americans is climbing is the decreasing number of people with employment-based coverage. Our system is employment-based. But more and more small businesses in particular are being priced out of providing health care coverage to their employees. And a second reason is that fewer people can afford to pay even their share of the premiums, even if their employers subsidize them. As I noted earlier, real incomes have fallen over the past decade while premiums have skyrocketed. Well, that's bad enough. What's already happened is bad enough. But consider this. The projected cost of yearly premiums for a, an average family in 2016, that's just four years from now, uh, will increase, if nothing is done to halt it, to $24,000 a year. Think about that just for a minute, $24,000. Now, that does include what employers pay, uh, uh, but that's almost half of the median household income in this country. Ten years from now, it's expected to rise to more than $31,000 unless effective reforms are implemented. And if that weren't bad enough, insurers are now making us pay much more for medical care out of our own pockets, even if we do have coverage. To accomplish this, insurance companies have been moving more and more of us into these high deductible plans that I mentioned earlier. Now, this is the here and now. Let's uh, combine higher deductibles with the increasing cost of premiums. Total health care cost, premiums plus deductibles for a family for, uh, for, uh, has doubled in less than a decade, from a little over $9,000 in 2002 to more than $19,000 a year now. And when you're underinsured, when your deductibles become too expensive, you, uh, you'll, you'll often go without the care that you need, just like families who are uninsured. It's gotten so bad now that an estimated one in three Americans are not getting the care or the medicines that they need because of the cost, even if they're insured. Worse, about 700,000 of our neighbors file for bankruptcy annually because of medical debt, and many of them lose their homes. 
And we're not just talking about one individual when that happens. We're talking about entire families and generations of people. And folks, that doesn't happen in any other, any other developed country in the world. What we have here is not a system. What we have is a mess. The reason I've spent all this time explaining the economics of our healthcare system is of what we call a system is because few people fully grasp just how expensive, how inequitable, and how inefficient our system has become, and why we really couldn't wait any, any longer than we did to try to, to transform it. Last year, you, as you know, Congress, so actually in 2010, uh, Congress did pass the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. Uh, the point of the law is to make insurance companies behave a bit more fairly toward us so that they, among other things, can't deny Ne uh, coverage for necessary care anymore, um, while also extending, um, uh, bringing more people into coverage and extending more options to families uh, who, don't, who can't get coverage to their employers. It'll also help you buy coverage individually at more affordable cost or more affordable price, and it'll make uh, some families uh, uh, able to qualify for Medicare if their income is low. In two years, it's estimated that uh, the new law will bring 30 million of those 50 million people into coverage, uh, which is very important. And people who have private insurance will be protected from uh, a lot of unreasonable premium increases and from being kicked off of coverage uh, when they get sick. Like every other attempt over the past century to do all of that, this one, uh, as we know, was met with strong opposition, just as, has, uh, as they have done since Republican President Theodore Roosevelt first proposed reform more than 100 years ago. The special interests uh, uh, who profit from the status quo have used fear and lies and misdirection to uh, try to stop it from happening. But unlike past attempts, this law, this bill finally became law. Now the special interest are behind a well-financed campaign of misinformation and fear-mongering to make us believe that the law is not in our best interest. And that explains why polls show that support for the law has eroded. Folks, don't be fooled. Uh, their objective, when I say their, I'm talking about the, uh, those who profit from the status quo. Their objective is not outright repeal of the law, despite what you hear. What they really want is to strip out the consumer protections that require them to treat us the way we deserve to be treated and to protect us from health care bankruptcy. What they do like is a requirement that we all have to buy coverage from them. Now, we've all heard some terrible things about this law. Uh, so before uh, we look at some of the changes that it's really brought, I, 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 I'd like to quickly address some of the misinformation. Probably the most infamous, infamous myth is that this law has created death panels of government bureaucrats <laughs> who will decide when people on Medicare will have to die. Well, that's more than a myth. It's, an, it's a lie. Uh, and, and that's not to say, that, folks, that death panels don't exist in this country, uh, but they're not in Medicare or anywhere else in government now or before. They're deep inside our health insurance companies. Just ask Natalie Sarkeesian's parents if you don't believe me. The next big lie is that the act uh, cuts Medicare benefits. In fact, thanks to the new law, Medicare is now paying for preventive care, <coughs> including important screenings like mammograms for the first time. And the law is also helping people in Medicare pay for their prescriptions. Uh, it's helping to close the donut hole in the prescription drug benefit. Now, I'm sure you've also heard that the law is a job killer and that it will hurt small businesses in particular. That's more misinformation. In fact, the law actually helps small businesses compete with large companies for talented workers by giving them, for the very first time, tax breaks if they offer subsidized coverage to their employees. Another myth I'm confident you've heard is that the government is now taking over health care. Raise your hands uh, if you've ever heard the Affordable Care Act described as a government takeover of health care. <laughs> well, back when I was in the insurance industry, my colleagues and I came up with that term <laughs> to, 
to scare the heck out of people, just like the term socialized medicine does, which is another invention of the special interests that profit from the status quo. We wanted you to believe that any reform that might hurt our company's profits would be a government takeover of health care. Well, judging by the show of hands I just saw, we did an outstanding job of making <laughs> you believe something that was absolutely not true. What is true is that we have had a Wall Street takeover of health care while we were not paying attention. And that, my friends, is what really should scare the heck out of us. So what effect did last year's legislation have on the American family? The Affordable Care Act already has made many of the worst practices of the insurance industry a thing of the past. And as I noted, it will eventually extend coverage to an estimated 30 million uninsured Americans. It's by no means perfect legislation, which means that we'll still have plenty of work to do in the future. I, I've often called it uh, the end of the beginning of reform. It's just a start, but it's an important one, and it's a beginning win for our families. If we lose it, we'll be back to square one, which would be an enormous and expensive tragedy in my view. That's because the law has already begun saving lives of thousands of our neighbors all across this country. And here's some of the ways it's doing that. It already allows children to stay on their parents' policies until age 26 if they can't find jobs that offer coverage. My daughter is among them. She has a job, but it's one of those small businesses that can't offer coverage. And it gives parents the assurance of knowing that their children cannot be denied coverage because of a pre-existing medical condition. And that important protection, by the way, will be extended to all of us in a couple of years. The law protects families from paying more and more for less and less coverage by requiring that insurance companies spend at least 80% of our premium dollars on our health care. Very important. They'll no longer be able to divert increasing amounts of our, mon our money to their top executives and shareholders. The law, it also protects us by requiring insurers to use plain and simple language, not legalese and marketing hype, to describe their policies, provisions, and restrictions. In other words, at long last, we'll be able to know exactly what our policies will cover and how much, of our, how much our out of pocket expenses will be when we get sick. We'll also not have to worry about reaching an annual limit on life or, or, or lifetime cap on how much our policy will pay for if we or a family member get critically ill. The law eliminates those caps, and it also limits how much we'll have to spend each year on copays and deductibles. It'll also reduce the hidden tax that those of us with private insurance pay every month to cover the care of people without insurance. Many people without insurance, they still get sick, uh, often very seriously sick. They go to the, the emergency room. Uh, hospitals can't turn people away, uh, but somebody has to pay for that care if, if those folks can't do it. And the people who pay for it are you and me through higher private insurance premiums. The Affordable Care Act is also improving and strengthening the Medicare program, as I mentioned before. Not only is it closing that donut hole uh, in the Medicare drug benefit and providing coverage for, for preventive care for the first time in Medicare history. It's also working to save money by providing uh, better, care, better, better care to people. It's, if it's implemented as Congress intended, it'll create incentives for physicians to talk to each other, uh, to work more closely together, more cooperatively, more collaboratively uh, as a team in caring for Medicare patients. And this should and will reduce unnecessary tests and, and unnecessary uh, drugs and, and the danger that uh, uh, different doctors will be prescribing medications that don't work well together. And it encourages and pays for preventive care. Uh, encouraging and, and paying for preventive care is another big way that the law will help, help reduce Medicare cost in the long run. And here are some things that are not true about the law. Uh, despite what you've heard, it is not socialized medicine. The truth is that the law uh, uh, actually is based on a Republican model of several years ago. 
uh, that preserves the current system of private insurance through state purchasing exchanges or marketplaces. You all are probably familiar with that here in uh, Kansas and, and Missouri uh, that are designed to allow us to shop for coverage in a way that we've never been able to do before. That'll make the purchasing of insurance much more rational and much less complicated. It will not bankrupt small businesses. It actually helps small businesses, as I noted earlier, to offer coverage to their workers through the use of, of tax credits. In fact, the law is already rewarding businesses that pay at least half the cost of, of their employers' premiums. The, the credit will help small businesses to hire and to retain employees, and if the Act's other reforms succeed, lower the cost of providing coverage. Small businesses have been at a, at a competitive disadvantage to big employers because of the way that the system has been in the past. And here's a very big and important thing that the law will not do. It will not increase the nation's deficit in the years to come. In fact, according to the nonpartisan, the bipartisan, if you will, Congressional Budget Office, it will reduce the, the deficit eventually significantly. So if, if, you, if what you do, if what you want to do is to increase the deficit by increasing the amount of money that we spend on health care, then repealing or gutting the law is a surefire way to do it. Folks, we absolutely must reduce the cost of health care in this country. Despite the huge shortcomings of our sickness industry, our government nevertheless spends more money on health care as a percentage of GDP or gross domestic product than any other country in the developed world. The United Kingdom, uh, by contrast, which has a nationalized system, uh, it's, it manages to spend uh, proportionately less than half the amount that we do. So folks, we need to keep pushing forward to, in my view, to protect the law, to protect Medicare and Medicaid, to protect the, the, the reforms that we've achieved. Rather than even thinking of going back, I think we need to go further to get every, everyone, not just 30 million of the 50 million uninsured, but every one of us, health care that we can afford. Yeah. But know this, as we do try to push forward, we're going to come up against the same opponents and the same tactics that we've seen time and time and time again. I know from personal experience that the insurance industry and a, a long list of other special interests, and that includes hospital systems, it includes organized medicine, it includes drug companies and medical device manufacturers. They'll do whatever it takes to try to block or repeal any reforms that might threaten their profits or their income. That's why it has taken us 100 years to get this far, because whenever you try to reform something like this, you're going to be affecting someone's profits or someone's income. Here's what they're going to say, that this law is not in our best interest. Expect to hear from the insurance industry's friends in the media and in political ads as we go into this, this cycle of, of our elections, uh, uh, that to the consumer protections of the law will drive up the cost of coverage and actually make insurance more unaffordable. That's just not true, folks. And expect them to say that it will cost jobs and that it will lead to higher taxes. I can guarantee you'll hear all of that and more. All of them are tried and true fear-mongering tactics that they trot out every time they want to scare us into voting against our own self-interest. I know this from years of working for the people who create and spread those lies and that fear-mongering. The reality is that we are now, uh, is that they're now using these tactics to obscure a truth that they don't want us to know. We'll be hearing how awful the law is and how we can't afford Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and we'll be hearing that to obscure the reality of who's really winning out there in our current system. Among the biggest beneficiaries of our current system are health insurance companies. Even though their executives have failed miserably at controlling costs and have overseen a huge increase in the number of uninsured and underinsured Americans. Not only that, but their most profitable years ever have been during the recent recession when millions of Americans lost their jobs, their health insurance, their homes, and their life savings. So how have they been able to do this? They've been able to do it because we've allowed them to get so big and so powerful 
that they now get to decide who has access to affordable care and who doesn't. We allowed a cartel of big insurance companies to set up and operate death panels to decide in many cases who lives and who dies. These practices, practices are just a few that have made it possible for insurance company chief executive officers to rank among the top paid executives in the country. In fact, United Healthcare's CEO uh, is now the highest paid CEO in America. One of the main reasons why family incomes have been falling is because our employers have been spending money that they ordinarily would have given us in raises to cover the constant increases in health insurance premiums. The money that workers should have received has gone instead into the pockets of CEOs and shareholders. Now, as you can imagine, those CEOs and shareholders of the insurance companies and many others who profit from our sickness industry are pressuring politicians in Washington and state capitals to uh, strip many of those protections out of the law and to put insurance companies fully back in charge of your health care. Insurers and their allies are also behind the effort to privatize Medicare. As you can imagine, they love the proposal that the government give every Medicare beneficiary a few thousand dollars so that they can buy their coverage from a private insurance company. Folks, that is exactly the wrong way to ensure that Medicare will be around for us, for our grandchildren, uh, and our grandchildren's grandchildren. Insurers would also love to have the federal government gut the Medicaid program by giving the, having the federal government hand over a set amount of money in block grants uh, to the states and letting them decide how to divvy up uh, that money among poor folks in their states. Advocates of this, this approach say it would give states more freedom to run the program as they would want to, and there's, there's truth to that. Uh, but I don't think I would trust a lot of states to do it in a fair and just way. What it would do, in reality, is give them the freedom to drastically cut the number of people who are eligible for Medicaid today. We cannot let these things happen. We went far too long, folks. We went far too long with a sickness industry that allowed too many men, women, and children to fall through the cracks. Before the Affordable Care Act, too many hardworking people couldn't afford to see a good doctor, and insurance companies dictated your coverage based on their profit margin. We cannot afford to go back to a time when those companies could cancel your coverage when you got sick and refuse to sell you coverage because of a pre-existing condition. Folks, I have a vision. Uh, and in just a few days, we're, we'll be celebrating the birth of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Remember his, his I Have a Dream speech. Well, I have a dream. I have a, a vision in, of this country in which uh, uh, no one will be considered uninsurable in this country because of a pre-existing condition. Uh, I have a dream in which no one will lose their coverage because uh, they just simply have lost their jobs and their, their children won't lose their coverage because of that. And I have a dream that, uh, uh, that, that no one will get kicked out of coverage just because they got sick with cancer or some other expensive-to-treat illness. And I have a vision in which no one has to file for bankruptcy or lose their homes because of medical debt. And I have a vision that no one has to die um, because they can't afford insurance. So it's imperative that we all get off the sidelines uh, to help make sure that we keep going forward, not backward. We must make sure that our friends and our neighbors understand what will be taken away if the special interests and their cronies in Washington succeed in gutting the new law and destroying Medicare and Medicaid and even Social Security. We need to explain to them how the Affordable Care Act really works and how it puts real people ahead of corporate profits, which it really does do. Instead of going backwards, let's build toward a future where the Affordable Care Act is a cornerstone of improving the health of families across our nation. If we do that, folks, those scenes that I described to you that I saw at the Wise County Fairgrounds will eventually become a thing of the past. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.